titled uh, the message, uh, Thomas, the Messenger of the Resurrection. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and have mercy on all of us. Please be with each and every one of us this evening as we look at your word. And Lord, I ask that uh, you hide me behind thy cross and that by thy Holy Spirit we hear the words of Jesus tonight. It's through Christ I pray. Amen. So tonight I'm honored to bring the message. I want to uh, thank Pastor Brian and, uh, and Madam for this opportunity. Um, I ask you for grace and mercy. I am not a pastor. Um, my primary calling uh, as a Christian is to the poor. Um, that's what I'm passionate about. Uh, however, uh, I do uh, like to teach once in a while. So uh, bear with me here. So the, the church that my wife and sons and I go to, we follow uh, the church calendar pretty closely. Um, all Christian churches follow a calendar. Um, we have our Christmas season, we have our Easter season, um, and uh, various, uh, you know, Good Friday, all of the things that we, we celebrate as Christians. And I think we came to the Good Friday service here, actually. Um, during, uh, we, we've, we're just actually coming out of uh, the Easter season. Um, so in many churches, it's not just one Sunday. There's a whole month and a half of uh, celebrating the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of those Sundays has been nicknamed Thomas Sunday. Thomas Sunday. And uh, it's on that day that uh, the reading in the, in the service during that time is about uh, uh, Thomas's um, interaction with the risen Lord uh, when he reveals his wounds in, in his hands and his side. And we hear the proclamation of Thomas about Jesus. We'll get to that here in uh, a little while here. But the nickname that this apostle of Jesus, Thomas, the nickname that he's been given, I think is the most unfair nickname any human has ever been given in the history of the world. Unfair, despicable nickname. I, wouldn't, I would never want to be called by his nickname. Some of you may know what his nickname is. Yeah, the, the doubter, the doubter. So we've, I mean, there's so many, you know, nicknames or titles of great people uh, throughout the world. You know, you've got Alexander the Great. I mean, the great is in his name, you know. Uh, even, even the bad uh, nicknames are mostly better than Thomas the doubter. You've got Ivan the Terrible. You know, at least he was remembered for being greatly terrible. You know, like uh, his his nickname, his nickname, I think is uh, you know a better better to be remembered by being great at something, even if it's being evil, than being a weak doubter. You know, it's just I think a very unfair nickname actually. And so what I want to do is I want to look at all of the passages that we have, well most of them, uh, in the Gospels uh, related to the Apostle Thomas. And uh, no, I didn't forget that I'm speaking to Indians tonight, uh, that uh, you, you, you should all be very acquainted with uh, uh, the man who brought Christianity to your shores. Um, so, but uh, this, every year when it comes around to this, this uh, the Easter season, and I'm reminded of Thomas the Doubter, it, like, I, I squirm in my chair a little bit, because when we look at, and we take a deep dive into the, the instances that Thomas uh, either speaks or the things that he does uh, or is willing to do in, in Scripture, and what we know from history, what he went on to do, it's the most unfair nickname anyone has ever received in the history of the world. So let us, uh, let us take a look here. Uh, so the, the first uh, passage I'd like to look at, and... Uh, I, I, I'll read most of them, but uh, you guys, you Indians are very quick at turning your Bibles, so I might ask some of you to help me read the passages. But Luke chapter 6 and um, verses 12 through 16. Gospel of Luke 
chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. So first and foremost, what is the first thing that we, we understand uh, about Thomas? That he was one of the 12 apostles, disciples, that Jesus chose to follow him in his earthly ministry. So this first and foremost, I mean, when we think about, you know, the New Testament, when we think about the life of Jesus, it's almost inseparable from these 12 men that he invited to follow along with him in his earthly ministry. So first and foremost, that's what we see about Thomas. Now, we don't have a bunch of details about Thomas's life. We don't know exactly what Jesus saw in Thomas or any of really the disciples um, to cause him to choose these 12. All we know is that Thomas made the list so, uh, you know, what made Jesus, you know, uh, select Thomas to be one of his disciples? We won't know until we, you know, get to heaven and we ask, you know, Jesus, hey, why did you choose these guys? Um, but the, the most important part of this is that Thomas was one of the 12 that Jesus chose to follow after him. Now, Jesus was a teacher and a rabbi. And so during, during this time, one of the most amazing honors somebody could receive was for a rabbi to come up to you and say follow me any anyone in no matter what your oh sorry i won't move around so much uh any one of uh any profession no matter what if you were a fisherman if you were a, a shepherd if you were a a, a business person it, it, for a jew for a, a child of israel it was the most amazing honor to follow after a rabbi and so if Jesus comes to this person, he must have seen something in Thomas, something. Um, and I think that uh, as the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, you know, also omniscient, uh, he probably saw what Thomas would eventually do as well. So we don't really know until hindsight why what Jesus might have seen in Thomas when he chose him. So first and foremost, as a, for this point here, we'll say that uh, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So first, first point I'll say, let us call him an apostle and not the doubter. Second uh, uh, passage that I'd like to look at is in uh, John chapter 11. John chapter 11 and uh, verses 1 through 16. Anyone who walks in the daytime 
will not stumble, but the seed by this world's life. It is when a person walks in night that they stumble, for they have no life. And after he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So we come to the second uh, uh, portion of scripture that we see mention of uh, some actual words. These are actually the first words that we see Thomas saying uh, in uh, the gospel accounts. So I like to try my best to picture the scene uh, when, I'm, when I'm reading scripture. So Jesus receives word that Lazarus is, you know, has, fallen, has fallen sick. And then he receives, uh, or Jesus knows that uh, Lazarus is not actually um, sleeping, but he's, he's died. But if you look up here, he says to his disciples, when he gets this, this news, he says, let us go to Judea again. So you picture Jesus and his disciples around him. Picture all of them, just their jaw hitting the floor. Lord, we just left that place. We just escaped that place, barely. We were almost stoned to death there. And you want to go back there. Uh, you know, all of the disciples, you know, for, you know, I love how they reveal their humanity because I, I, would, be the, I would be the same way. Lord, we just barely escaped with our lives a couple days back and you want to go back there. And I, I just see all the commotion, all of the disciples, you know, you know, uh, petitioning the Lord. Lord, no, come on. Like, let's stay away, you know, maybe take a different route, you know. Hey, you know, let's, uh, let's take a different train, you know. Like, whatever we have to do, but we can't go back to Judea. You almost died there just now. And uh, I picture Thomas breaking into the crowd, breaking through the disciples, and boldly saying, let us go and die with him. This is the man that we've given the nickname Doubter. This man who was the only one of the disciples that was willing to go to his death alongside his Lord. We see other instances of disciples. Peter saying that no matter what, Lord, I'll never deny you. And then he, we see him outside of the courts, warming himself by the fire as the cock crows. And Thomas breaks in and says, if we die, we die. Let us go with him. He would go anywhere with his Lord. So this is the second, uh, the second instance that we, we see mention of Thomas. And this is the first uh, of a couple bold things that Thomas um, mentioned and said in, in the gospel accounts. Let us go with him, even if it's going to be to our death. Um, so Thomas would follow his Lord anywhere, um, even through the, the doors of death. Next one I want to look at is uh, uh, John 14. So just a couple pages over, John 14, verses 1 through 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, 
we do know him and have seen him. So what, what is it? This is, you know, possibly the, the, our Lord's reply here is possibly one of the most well-known um, verses, uh, 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 men, you know, utterances of our Lord. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I personally, 2,000 years removed, am very, very happy that Thomas, the apostle of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, asked such a simple question. Lord, how can we, how can we follow you? How, how, do we know where, how, how do we know where you're going if we don't know the way? A very logical question. When you look at uh, the, the context here, and Jesus is saying, I, I'm, I'm going, I am leaving, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, to the disciples, all of this must have just sounded like, whoa, like, what do you mean we know where you're going? And Thomas wasn't afraid to ask a very simple question. Lord, what are you talking about? Where are you going? How can we follow you if we do not know the way? And then we, through Jesus' response to Thomas, Thomas's inquiry here, his question, we find out something incredibly important about the identity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Because of the inquiry of the man that we have so terribly nicknamed the doubter, we come to a statement of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that is so integral, so important to our understanding of who Jesus Christ is, that he is God in the flesh, that he is, who, who will work out later in, in later centuries, the second person of the Trinity, this is the, the seedling of that idea. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How many sermons have been preached on this one verse throughout the last 2,000 years? How many sermons would not maybe have been preached if a man named Thomas didn't ask a question? The next one I want to look at is uh, um, John 20, 19 through 25. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with Oh, one, one moment. I will stop right there for now. That's the next one. Thank you. Notice that the first appearance of Jesus to the disciples, it says there that Thomas was not with them. That's a very important little detail there when we're reading the account of our Lord's resurrection that when our Lord first appeared to the disciples first revealed himself in the resurrection body to his disciples showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side Thomas was not there now I don't have any scripture to back any of this up that I'm going to say so I lay that disclaimer but I try to use my imagination and, uh, you know, using the context of, of uh, what I might be going through if 
the person that I knew as the Lord, the person who I was willing to go and die with, the person that I had all of these ideas about, I watched be crucified. This man who's, who just a couple chapters ago, a little while ago, said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The, the, the man who you know Thomas was willing to go and die with, he watched be crucified. So it's not at all really shocking to me why he wasn't there. I don't know how I would react if somebody very, very close to me passed away. I'm very, very blessed. I've not lost anyone close to me. All of my family's alive. All four of my grandparents are alive. They're in their 80s. I've not lost anyone very close to me. My wife has, and I've seen what uh, loss has, has brought to her. But I feel like the disciples' relationship with Jesus would have made his death even crazier than losing a family member. I mean, this was a person that they gave up everything to follow. They followed this man breakfast, lunch, and dinner for three years. For three years, they listened to every word that he said. They saw all of the miracles that he did. Just think of all of the things that the disciples experienced while walking with Jesus. The things that they saw. You know, the, 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 the widow's only son. They, they were there when Jesus went up to the, the, to, to the procession, the funeral procession, and rose from the dead, her only son. They were there when, he, you know, he went to the, the uh, paralytic and said, rise, take up your mat and walk. They were, he was there and watched all of this. So what sort of, what sort of confusion and despair would be going through your head if you saw a person who you witnessed do all of these amazing miracles, walk on water, bring sight to the blind, you know, unloose the tongue of the mute, you know, heal the withered hand. And not to mention all the amazing things that he said and the teachings that he taught. It would be inconceivable, and it was inconceivable, unthinkable that this man could die. And not only did he die, but he died naked on a cross. Where was Thomas? No idea. Have no account of where he was. But I wouldn't be surprised if he was in a back alleyway, weeping for the loss of his Lord. Just completely distraught, beside himself. I mean, when, when the, these people, when they followed, when they, when these disciples, when they followed Christ, it wasn't just like, you know, when you're friends with somebody. You're friends with somebody, but they're a different person. Your identity isn't like completely wrapped up in that other person. When somebody followed Jesus, their identity was changed. When, you're, when, when you go out to eat with somebody, you're sitting next to somebody. When you go out to eat with Jesus, you're, you're with him. Your identity is wrapped up in him. Uh, you know, they, uh, they later on would be called, the followers of Christ would later be called followers of the way. Which is, what is the way? <laughs> Jesus is the way. Their identity would later be so entwined with who and what Jesus proclaimed, who he was, uh, that uh, they would start calling them eventually uh, in an early Italian language, Christiani, the Christians. Those who follow Christ. So these people, that when they followed Christ, they weren't just following some guy. They were following somebody that their identity would later be shaped by this person. And uh, be so intertwined that they couldn't be thought of as anything but the followers of that guy. Um, so when the, when the disciples experienced the crucifixion, and not only the crucifixion, but... Just imagine the trauma of waking up out of a dead sleep when you're in 
a forest and Roman soldiers are coming and capturing your Lord. Like a lot of times, I don't think that we properly put ourselves in the place of these biblical characters. Like how we would, how would we react? Especially after we fall asleep three times and then we wake up and we, and we understand why he was telling us to watch. <laughs> and we're watching our Lord, you know, the Lord that we follow being, you know, chained up and, and taken away. And then, you know, I, I, you know, you, you imagine Peter looking through the, the cracks and windows of the courthouse as he's being, you know, inquired upon by the, the um, religious leaders of the time and uh, the governor. You know, all, all the reactions and, and, and then ultimately watching him go down the Via de la Rosa, you know, all the way to, the, to Calvary. Watching and experiencing all of that, I don't know if I could handle it. I think I would, I would snap. And I think that's what happened to Thomas. So I don't know where he was, but the only thing I can think of is all of the things that he experienced drove him completely mad. He had no, he was beside himself, just not even able to comprehend all of the things that had happened. And so we see in the first um, appearance of, of Jesus that he is not even there. He's beside himself. But he comes back into the story with this next passage. If you would continue reading from 26 to 31. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Amen. the Son of God, that by believing we may have life in his name. So notice that the beloved disciple John, when he's writing this account, he says in this second part of this uh, appearance to the disciples, that Thomas was with them. He's very intentional for the second time here, when Jesus is appearing to the disciples, to say that this time Thomas was with them. First time he was not with them, Second time he was with them to provide a further proof. And this was the very point of what, you know, his account was written for. He tells us there, he says, all of these things that we witnessed, we have written, I've written these things down so that you may believe. So this is, this is, a, he's purposely written this line in there to show that Thomas was not there the first time. So that's one occurrence of, that's one occurrence of, Ten people seeing the risen Lord after he had risen from the dead. Now, you insert Thomas, that's a second time of people seeing a different group. Not only an addition of one, but still a different group. Somebody that wasn't there the first time is now here a second time. So that's a very, very intricate detail there that we, that we just gloss over sometimes. That... The second appearance of our Lord, there was somebody who wasn't there in the first appearance. And this is what happened. Corroboration of the first account, we find in the second account of his uh, appearing to the disciples. Further proof, that's just an aside really, just a, a note to see there. We see Christ telling Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now it doesn't say, notice, it doesn't say that he did that. Jesus offered it to him. He says, here, come and touch, come and feel, come and see. The wounds are here, it is me. 
The same person that you saw on the cross, I'm standing right here. I am alive again. And yes, I was in the grave for three days, but now I'm alive and I'm with you now. Now that's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> that's a whole nother lesson. How he can pass through walls, but yet eat fish. All, uh, you know, people can think very hard, you know, very hard about that and think that's a difficult concept. I personally am looking forward to not running into walls anymore. So if you can pass through them, but still eat fish, I'm okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. But it doesn't say that he did it. It, do, it doesn't, he, he didn't even need to. Now we don't know if he didn't. We just know that in this account here, it says that, it doesn't say that he did. But how, how much, what, else, what other proof do you need than if Jesus says, hey, the holes are here. The spear wound is here. And what do we see here? The person that we have nicknamed the doubter put Peter to shame. Peter, his proclamation was, what, what was his proclamation? What did he say? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's correct. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. It is right. And he was attributing very similar um, status and honor and glory as Thomas did. But Thomas took it to another level. It says, my Lord and my God. We have the first mention in the history of the world of somebody giving the title Theos, God to Jesus Christ. And we call him the doubter. We don't have record of any other disciple saying this. We don't have record of any other human saying this in the, in the accounts of the Gospels. And we have Thomas hitting his knees and saying, my Lord and my God. And because of this instance also, we have utterances of Jesus Christ that mean something to us. 2,000 years removed. Listen to these words as if they're talking about you, because they are. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead through faith, primarily, but also because I believe in what these disciples said. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead because a man hit his knees and said, after seeing this person, after seeing his wounds, after encountering and, and, and seeing the whole experience of this man being crucified, nobody lived through crucifixion. I, I, I want to be I want to be I want to be clear with that. There was one there was one guy, but he was pulled off early. <laughs> That's in an account of Josephus. Nobody who was fully crucified <laughs> and stayed on the cross lived. Eventually you couldn't breathe anymore. You couldn't pull yourself up anymore and take any more breaths. This guy who was on that cross, three days later, Thomas is bowing down and saying, my Lord and my God. Jews were strictly monotheistic. You hear in the Old Testament, okay, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall have no other gods besides him. Okay, it was anathema. Curses be upon anybody that says there's any other gods but our God. But these, you see, these disciples, they witnessed something that completely, they had to do something with their worldview. Like, what do we do with this guy who just walked out of the grave? What do we do with this guy? What do we do with Jesus? They worshiped him as Lord and God. 
I believe 2,000 years later, 2,000 years removed in the resurrection, partly because Thomas bowed down in front of a man that he believed rose from the dead. And we call him the doubter. And lastly, as you guys all know, being Indians, we know, uh, and we have pretty, pretty good historical evidence for, the fact that this same man who witnessed the resurrection, the resurrected Christ, I mean, just imagine that. If, if, just imagine you witnessed it in person. Now, today's you know, day and age is no different than the first century. A lot of skeptics would make you to believe that the first century people were gullible. You know, they were just simple-minded. That they just believed that people popped up from the dead all the time. That people just rose from the dead all the time. They'll make you believe that. What was it? You know, all the, the first century people, they were so dim-witted. Of course they would believe that a man rose from the dead. No. Don't let them fool you. They were more acquainted to, about death than we are. We have modern medicine. We have dentists. <laughs> we have all of these medicines and all of the, you know, these things that keep us alive a whole lot longer than the first century. They were acquainted way more with death than we here in the West are. You, you, you Indians, you're a lot more acquainted because a lot of times, more often than not, uh, you know, your family, if anyone passes, they're in your home. My wife, Samachi, just uh, recently passed. She was at home. So you guys experience it. See, in the West, we've completely removed ourselves from death. When somebody dies, most of the time, 90% of the time, they're at the hospital. Or they're at the nursing home. Or they're away from, they're away from the family. It's a seriously rare blessing for a man or a woman to die surrounded by her family or his family in the United States. But what if you witnessed a man die and in the manner that he died and then you afterwards, three days later, witnessed what we just looked at in the, in the gospel account of John. That same man with the wounds in his hands and the scar, in, in, you know, the, the gash in his side from the spear speaking with you. And then a few days later, there's a, a, another mention of Thomas that he was also in the the boat, when the disciples went back to the fishing and they jumped out of their boat because they saw a guy grilling up fish on the beach. And uh, they witnessed all of this. And then it says in Acts that he was with them for you know 40 days. I think it was 40 days, if I remember right. 40 days longer. And there was many other signs, you know, many other things that they saw. Proofs of his resurrection, it says in Acts. You witnessed that how could you be silent about it? How could you not want to tell the world that death, this normal, unavoidable thing that we all have to deal with, this despairing event that we all go through, that we watch our loved ones go through, death was defeated. A guy actually came back. He was very dead. Three days later, we saw them very alive, and I ate broiled fish with him. We see this guy travel from the Middle East to Kerala. How much of a crazy thing, especially, okay, in the first century, mind you, he didn't get on a plane, he didn't fly Delta, he got on a boat, and he got on camels, and he got on horses, and he walked all the way to Kerala and told the Brahmins that, hey, you worship the sun. Throw the water up into the sky and watch it come down. But if I throw the water up in the sky in the name of Jesus and it stays up there, and the water doesn't come down, just know that, the, that God has arrived in, in, in India. The true God has arrived in India. And then he baptized them. And we see Christianity coming to India. And 2,000 years later, I'm taking a train for 34 hours 
with my wife down the western coast of India, and I know I'm coming to Kerala when I start seeing more crosses than temples. And this man, who we call the doubter, was the man that brought Christianity to India. And you all are inheritors of that. Because a man who witnessed the resurrection of Christ went and proclaimed it to the far lands of the earth. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, thank you so much for this time. And thank you for...